I'm excited about this message. Um, we, we started this uh, cinema, Christmas cinema series, and I knew right away what uh, Christmas movie I wanted to use. It's my favorite Christmas movie. And the fear I had, if I can confess fear to you this morning, the fear I had was that God was going to say, no, nah, let's do a different one. But he didn't. He gave me what I wanted. And uh, Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. So you'll see a little bit later, but how many of you in here have, have seen Fred Claus? Okay, well, some of you are going to know. Spoiler alert for the ones that hadn't, but hopefully by the end of this message, you'll want to see Fred Claus. I'm not saying that Fred Claus is uh, theologically sound completely, but you'll see. So the title of my message today is The Reconciler is Born. The Reconciler. Christ came to this earth on mission, on mission to reconcile a lost and sinful mankind back to his father. I'm going to read straight through these three verses in Isaiah, Matthew, and Luke, and then we'll get started. And Ken, Ken used this verse last week, which you can't have a Christmas message without this verse. But For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Matthew it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And in Luke, For there is one born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. I want to make a statement that Nothing about Christ's birth was reactionary. What do I mean by that? I mean this. God does not react. He acts. God does not react to things. He acts. And we tend to place God in this box sometimes. Well, because this happened, God's going to do this. And we think we know. We think, well, if this happens, God will do this. And if this happens, he's going to do this. And he's always reactionary, which takes away some of his authority in our mind. My first point is God's perfect plan. God's perfect plan. As I was studying, I was reading all different kinds of commentators and, and different things. And, and I came across this sermon from uh, Charles Spurgeon in he was he he gave this sermon in 1878. I was thinking, well, that's a long time ago, and I don't know how relevant it would be. But see, the Bible's timeless. I want to read this to you, and this <laughs> bear with me because they spoke a little differently in 1878, but not too bad. But I want to read the first half of the sermon. And just um, kind of sets the tone for what I'm wanting or what God's wanting to communicate today. There has been a long standing quarrel between God and man. It commenced in the day when our first parents hearkened to the serpent's voice and believed the devil rather than their maker. Yet God is not willing for that quarrel to continue. According to the goodness of his nature, he delights in love. He is the God of peace, and he has on his part prepared everything that is needful for a perfect reconciliation. His glorious wisdom has devised a plan whereby without violating his justice as the judge of all the earth and without tarnishing his perfect holiness, he can meet man upon the ground of mercy, and man can again become the friend of God. See, when you're apart from God, he loves you, but yet you're not in fellowship. In some translations it says you were an enemy, now you're a friend. An enemy of God. 
I'm setting all this up because I want you to see that God does not react, he acts. There is and was a perfect plan A for mankind. This is the plan A. Plan A from the very beginning was the garden. Perfect peace, personal, intimate relationship with God, Jesus born of a virgin, and Jesus crucified on the cross. There was never a plan B. You see, what God's first words that's recorded that he spoke in Scripture. Does anybody know? First words, it says God spoke in Scripture. Let there be light. That was second. In Genesis 1-3, it said, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. He spoke light to it in existence, and remember that because I'm going to come back to it. In Revelation 13, 8, he says, And all the people who belong to, to this world worship the beast. They are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb, who was slaughtered before the world was made. When you think about that plan A, his first plan and you read Revelation where it says he was slaughtered. A lot, of, a lot of translations says slain. I think slaughtered captures it. We can't wrap our minds around a God who says it is good. He creates everything. It's perfect. But I've already crucified my son for these people, for man. You know, we, I say all the time, and I have some friends that say this, you know, God knew before the world was created. He did. It's not something that we use lightly. And it's not something that we can really understand. In God's economy, there was an answer before there was a question. There was a solution before there was a problem. There was a redeemer before there was sin and there was a reconciler before there was any conflict. See, he doesn't react. He acts. He already figured all this out. He already knew. And we can say, well, God knows everything, and he does. But when you really just sit back, and, I, and, and you know, I think this hit me hard because as I was studying this week, I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm thinking, how did that work? I wanted to kind of work it out in my mind. God says, uh, I'm going to step out of nothing. I'm going to stand on something, and I'm going to create everything. And then this perfect thing is going to rebel. But guess what? I'm going to already make a way for them to come back. And my question is, we say all these things, but do your thoughts line up with your beliefs when it comes to everyday life? Do your thoughts, when you say, oh, God knows everything. Oh, God, there, there's a solution before there's a problem. There's a redeemer before there was sin. There's a reconciler before there was conflict. Do you act like that? When life hits you with things, when, when someone attacks you, when, 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 when you hear um, a bad health report, do you still fall back? God knew that was happen. He loves me. He's got a solution. He's got a plan. There is a redeemer. What gift did Jesus bring? A bunch. Easy question. I'm not going to trick you. A bunch. But it's, our, it, it's the verse, uh, I want to read 2 Corinthians 5.18, and this is the verse that 
I think the message is really based on. <clears throat> now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. As believers, do you realize you have a ministry? Even if you don't, even if you're not a part of, even if you didn't, even if you didn't qualify to come to the volunteer banquet, do you realize you have a ministry? One person said it like this, when you accepted Christ, you enrolled into the ministry of reconciliation. You enrolled. What does that mean? I truly believe that there are people, including myself, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I had no idea that I was enrolling into the ministry of reconciliation. It was an add-on. Here's what it means. As a Christian, we help non-believers be reconciled to God and believers be reconciled to one another. Reconciliation is the end of the estrangement caused by original sin between God and humanity. This is what God said. I created this perfect place. They messed up. I'm going to send my son to reconcile them back to me. Reconciliation is also the end of estrangement caused by unforgiveness between believers. Why do we need a ministry of reconciliation? Because no matter how good you are, no matter if you are Jesus Jr. on the front row of church every Sunday, you've been a born Baptist, whatever, you are going to sin. And there are going to be people in your life, family, friends, in your marriage that you don't get along with. That you mess up. God knew that. He knows that we need to be reconciled to him first. But we're not going to be very um, effective if we're not reconciled to each other. We can't run around hating on each other and do what he wants us to do. And show people Christ's love. Even Santa Claus messes up. I'm going to show you this first clip. I want to set it up for those of you that hadn't had the privilege of watching Fred Claus. Fred Claus is Santa's older brother. He got skipped over. Could have been, you know, it could have been Fred Claus. It could have been, he could have been the, he could have been the, the Santa Claus of the world. There's a lot of resentment, unforgiveness in his heart. And the way Fred dealt with it was to leave. He said, see ya, Mama Claus, Daddy Claus, Santa Claus, I'm out. He separated himself, which is what we do a lot of times. When there's conflict, when there's things we don't like, what do we do? We avoid. We avoid. In this scene, he has been forced to come back and spend time with his brother, Santa Claus, like a lot of us are going to do around the holidays. We're going to have a family member or somebody say, I really want you to come to this Christmas party, and there's going to be people there that you really don't want to be around. You're going to be forced. And if you spend enough time with people that you have not reconciled with, that you have unforgiveness towards, bitterness towards, this is what's going to happen. Talking, fat-talking, punk! You know I've been battling away problems for years, Fred! That is not funny! You know what? You can shove it, thunder thighs! I'm <sighs> sick of it! This little tree's gonna get some light, Nick! This little tree's gonna chop that big tree down! I don't have to take your abuse! Nick, I couldn't miss you by class! I couldn't miss you by class because you're so fat! You slow like a girl! Like a big leather jacket-wearing girl! Come on, fat boy! How'd you get to work today, Nick? Did you roll? Oh, yeah? Did How'd you, you get here? Did you steal a sled from some little kid? 
Good night, sweet prince. some reconciliation <laughs> let me tell you what the next words out of their mouth were Santa Claus looks at Fred and he says I didn't know you hated me that much and Fred said I don't hate you I just wish you were never born Let that settle for a second. Complete honesty. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But that kind of feelings reside in us. That's why we need the spirit, that's why we need the ministry of reconciliation. See, sin, which is unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, sin causes decay. Decay causes death. God is life. And life comes from reconciliation. John 8, 12 says this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Remember God's first words? Let there be light. He didn't create Jesus, but he put a reference. in The first thing he did in Scripture was give us a reference point of how amazing Jesus is. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I want to talk about a couple things that we just witnessed in that clip. The first one was jealousy. There was, there was, Fred was jealous of his brother. He was jealous. What is jealousy? jealousy? Jealousy is usually directly tied to this spirit of entitlement. Assuming you're owed something. You, you see someone, maybe you're, maybe you're a hard worker, and you see someone and they receive something at work. They receive a little bit higher bonus. Maybe they receive a promotion. And there's something in you that stirs up and says, that should have been me. That should have been me. It can be covetousness, which is one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. It is wanting something or thinking that you deserve something that someone else has. This happens in pastors sometimes. I know you're shocked. We deal with this. Why? Why do we deal with this? Because as pastors, we're called into this ministry. It is definitely a calling. I will testify to that. Because what happens with pastors is we, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm just speaking transparently. And God has really blessed me and my family. But I want to say, there was times where I would say, are you sure? Because if I do that, I can make that. And we can have that. Are you sure? Are you sure about this pastor thing? I mean, I can still be the best volunteer they've ever had. 
See, jealousy can creep in. You can look and say, man, if I was doing that, I could have that. But why does he get that? And I'm doing God's work. He's not doing God's work. He gets that. You know, so jealousy can creep in from this spirit and, and mindset of entitlement. It also causes you to go a place in your mind where you assume you know the heart of someone else. You assume you know why they did something or said something. You assume that you can see into their heart because you are so discerning. But scripture clearly says that God's the only one that sees the heart. The other thing we witnessed here was resentfulness, bitterness, Bitterness and resentfulness, they contaminate. Scripture talks about bitter water. You know, if I'm bitter and you get around me for too long, you'll get a little bitter too. Case in point, the news. You can be perfectly happy. Things are going great. And you watch something on the news and that bitterness just jumps right out of that screen on you. And then what do you do? You're sitting around with your family. My wife gives me this instruction every Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthday parties. When we go to your mom's house, don't start talking about politics. <laughs> we get bitter and we're all on the same side. Imagine what would happen if somebody wasn't. We just sit around and commiserate about the worst things that's happening. Bitterness contaminates, and it will cause you to be easily offended. We live in the most offended society ever known to man. I would dare say the children of Israel in bondage were not as offended as we are this day. We also saw unforgiveness. All the above on unforgiveness. It, it affects everything I just said. Plus, unforgiveness will cause physical problems, stress, high blood pressure. All these things can come from just having unforgiveness in your heart towards someone. And what you don't even realize is Unforgiveness for a past relationship that you don't even have anymore affects the success of your current relationships. You don't even realize it. You don't even realize that you, you're dragging this unforgiveness with you and the people that you are in relationship with now wonder why you're upset or mad sometimes or things bother you and it's because you haven't let it go. And the root of all these is anger. But you know what? I've never met someone that says, I really like being an angry person. I like it when people refer to me as an angry person. It's usually an attack. You say, hey, man, you got anger problems. Oh, no, that's, that's an attack. What's the opposite of these things? What, what's our goal? You know, I don't want to leave you there in the shame puddle. What's our goal? Jealousy to contentment. Resentful and bitterness to kindness. Unforgiveness to mercifulness and anger to joy. We're in the season of joy. You have opportunities. You have opportunities that you won't usually have. You can, you can offer forgiveness to people during the Christmas holidays as a gift. You know, hey, it's Christmas. We hear that before? Hey, it's Christmas. Let's get along. It's Christmas. So you got a, you got a, little, you got a little out there. So you don't completely have to humble yourself. <laughs> Serious? What do you think reconciling means? I say that word, you know, let's reconcile. I want to reconcile. I come up with this. I'm, it says, taking forgiveness to the next level. That's what it is. Enemies to friends. See, You can tell this message kind of affected me this week because 
I'm trying to direct it on you because I'm tired of directing it on me. <laughs> but I, I have never had a problem in my adult life forgiving people. It's a Christian thing to do. God tells me to forgive, and I will forgive. I can be obedient. And people have, everybody in here has had people do them wrong. And I've always said, I forgive that person. And I really do. I really, really do. People come to my mind, and I don't even have a bad thought about them anymore. I have forgiven that person. And I felt really good about that. I felt really good about it. I can forgive people. And I can say today that there is no one in my memory that I have unforgiveness towards. I'm glad to say that. I think it's a testimony to what God can do with anybody. But reconcile? Different story. Different story. I've shared this with some of my friends. Um, I was at my desk one day really patting myself on the back about forgiving people. And I may have shared it. You know, if you hear me speak long enough, some of these stories are going to come back, so just bear with me. But I was patting myself on the back about forgive, forgiving people, and God said, well, uh, I need you to be reconciled with that, those two people, with that person. I said, sure, no problem. What is that? Started learning about it. I said, okay, I want to be friends with them again. I texted him. He responded. We met. We talked for about an hour. We forgave each other. We're friends. Beautiful. Come back to my office. Felt really good about that. God put another name on my heart. I said, whoa, now, you're really, you're meddling now, Lord. That's, uh, that's a little tougher. Reached out to this person. Said, hey, I want to get together. Want to reconcile. They said no. And the weight lifted off of me like I can't explain. I feel good about that person. If that person came in these doors right now and said, hey, I want to talk to you, I would do it. But the, the burden that I felt to reconcile is gone. It's gone. Uh, because I was obedient, with you, there's people in your lives that you think, there is no way I can reconcile with that person. I'll forgive them because God told me to, but I, there's no way we'll ever be friends. And I don't, want to, I don't want this to become a point of shame for anybody today. Like, if you don't reconcile with this person, you're a bad person. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that as you pray and you ask God, if he tells you that he'll reconcile you, Trust him. He has a plan. His plan is perfect. He knew there was going to need to be reconciliation before the conflict happened. And what I want to do today is I want to give you some steps to do that. And I'm going to focus on three areas, family, marriage, and friends. Now, before you think I'm never going to remember all this, my wife and daughter have created this wonderful brochure <laughs> that will be available as you leave. And I was, all this stuff was in my head and I was trying to figure out how to say it. And God reminded me why I married an English major. And she figured it out for me. So, And then my other daughter, and then my daughter took care of putting it in a copy where you can have. So say you want to reconcile with someone. God said reconcile. Here's the steps. Begin with intentional prayer. That's how it starts. Ask Holy Spirit to give you the ability to show the same forgiveness to that person as Christ has shown you. See, reconciliation happens between believers. We're talking about between believers now. 
We're reconciled back to God. And then our job is to help others get reconciled back to God and help believers reconcile to each other. Sometimes we're the people that need to be reconciled. Pray for God to soften your heart before you begin the steps of reconciliation. See, set this thing up right. Don't just say, okay, I'm going to reconcile. Pray. Give us some time. There's no time limit on this. Ask God, God, get me ready because, and be honest with him, he can handle it. I don't want to. I don't even like that person. But you say you want, us, you want all believers to be reconciled. Give me the heart to do that. Trust God in the process. You can shorten it to trust the process, but trust God in the process. What does that look like? Trust that God's plan is perfect and do not allow distractions or obstacles to get in the way. Distractions and obstacles will get in the way. You know what the enemy will do as soon as this reconciliation wheel starts turning? Distraction, obstacles. Your phone rings. This happens. That happens. Three weeks later, you'll think, I never, I never, I never did that. Distractions. Begin releasing bitterness and anger through prayer. As, as the Holy Spirit clarifies these things to you and says, that's where you were really hurt right there. Pray into that and start praying, God, help me release that. Get rid of it. Once areas are revealed, let them go. I mean, walk away from it. Walk away from it. Let it go. Here's, here's, here's probably the most important step. When you feel them start creeping back in, and they probably will, repeat the process. Repeat the process until it's done. And then move forward without fear. See, fear is the enemy's way of keeping us captive, not realizing our full potential in the Lord. It's his way of saying, I don't really want to reconcile with that person because if I do, they'll hurt me again. They'll hurt me. So therefore, I'm going to lock that part of my heart up. I'm not going to give it. I'm not, I'm not, going, to, I'm not going to let that be used again. Because if I get, if that, that was my best friend and they hurt me. That was my brother and he hurt me. That was my pastor and he hurt me. <clears throat> that was my wife. She hurt me. See, there's marriages out here that are walking around married, unreconciled. They got issues. Some of them so bad, I can tell you, I don't even know how they even stand to be in the same room with each other. It's sad. And all they need to do is start praying and releasing bitterness and asking God to help them reconcile. If they are believers, they have what? The ministry of reconciliation. Have the ability. So move forward. Don't let fear hold you back from doing what God wants you to do. And once you've, once you've got rid of all the strongholds and you've moved forward, you're either going to restore the relationship or you're going to get some healing from the bondage that it kept you in. Just like me. I didn't restore that last relationship, but I got healing from it. And I've got a heart that when I think about that person now, I smile and I, and I remember good things. See, 1 John 1, seven says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one, one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John 8.12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, 
but will have the light of life. John 17 is, I don't want to say it's a private conversation, but it's a conversation between Jesus and his father. The whole chapter is Jesus praying to his father. And there's some things in this. I've read this prayer before, and, and, I, and I love it. But there's some things that really stuck out with me as far as reconciliation goes. And I want to read it to you, and I'm going to emphasize the, what, what, what really stuck out to me. And, and apply it to this model that I've given you about reconciling with everybody. As a believer, you are to reconcile. And this is how important it was to Christ. Starting at verse 20. I am praying not only to these disciples. He's talking about the 12. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you. That's me. I pray all be one just as you and I are one. Doesn't get any closer than that, by the way. As you and as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. If we're that close to each other, the world will believe. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Have you ever thought about that? That God loves you as much as he loves Jesus? Do we act like that? Do we think that if we reconcile with each other and we have this perfect unity that Christ says is possible, it is possible for us to be just as close with each other as he is with God. It's possible because he says it is possible. If you look around our community, let's just take Kannapolis. I ride down certain roads and I say, oh, there's a church. Oh, there's a church. Oh, there's a church. Oh, there's a church. There's a church. Like some, some of our streets have four and five churches on them. In my mind, I think, somebody said, uh, I don't like this church anymore. I'm going to go start me a church. Start me a church. I'm a, I'm, we, we, let's, let's go over here and start a church. See, there was a, I always like telling this joke, so if you've heard it, don't, don't let it go. But there was a desert island, one man on this desert island, and one day after like 30 years, he got rescued. Boat pulls up to rescue him. They pull up and they say, and they see three buildings. They said, well, where's everybody at? He said, that's just me. Well, did they die? No, no. I'm the only one that's ever been here. I got, I got shipwrecked a long time ago. Why you got three buildings? He said, well, that's my house. Oh, okay. So said, what's the next one? That's the church. That's my church. He said, what's the next one? He said, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we can't even get along with ourselves. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do to be reconciled to our brothers and sisters and fellow churches. I just got a I just got a cold chill just then thinking about the reconciliation that's happening right now with our youth group. Almost a, a eleven years later, there's a church in this community that didn't like it very much. I'll just say it kindly. 
and 11 years and prayer and the heart of reconciliation, our youth group is joined with them and using their bus to go on their next trip. If you know anything about churches, the bus is the thing you don't lend out much. You know, you just don't, the bus is kind of sacred to some churches. And I just thought, man, that's reconciliation. My next, my last point is the reconciler was born to die. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. Everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. There is nothing that can't be reconciled. There is no relationship. There is no relationship that was farther apart than you and I before we were saved from God. Nothing. First Timothy says this. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth? God desires all men to be saved. Second Peter, the last part of that verse says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All is all. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't get bogged down in, in, in certain theological views about all. All is all. God wrote this book for us, the ordinary man. And he didn't write it to confuse us or to have to have a priest to read it to us. There was an answer before there was a question. There was a solution before there was a problem. There was a redeemer before there was sin. And there was a reconciler before there was conflict. You know, I told you God had one plan, right? I want to show you that plan again. Take a good look at the points. The garden, perfect peace, personal intimate relationship with God, Jesus was born to a virgin. Jesus was crucified on a cross. Now I'm going to show you that plan again. Jesus was crucified on a cross. We get to be born again, which causes us to have a personal, intimate relationship with God, which gives us perfect peace in our heart. And one day, the garden, heaven and earth will pass away. That first movie clip showed two brothers who did not like each other. One did not want the other one to even be born. They said mean things to each other, hurtful things. I want you to think about, as we watch this last clip, who in your life, don't overwhelm yourself, just pick a couple, one, that God is telling you right now, I want to reconcile that relationship. I want to start there. I want to see you and that person be reconciled, be friends, fall back in love with each other, whatever. And I think this clip right here shows reconciliation in a perfect way. Just to set it up quickly, after the fight that we saw, Santa Claus couldn't deliver presents. Hurt his back. And nobody else could do it except the Claus. So after much agonizing, Fred steps up to the plate because he loves his brother. So
So, if Santa Claus can be reconciled, who in your life, I ask you again, there's some thought going on in this room right now. I can see it on your faces. You know why? Because we all have people in our lives that we're unreconciled with. Don't let Jealousy, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, fear keep you from doing what God has gifted you to do. He gifted you. He gifted you with the ministry of reconciliation. Do you believe that? Remember I talked about your beliefs lining up with your actions? As we sing this last song, of course I want you to worship, but I also want you just to take a moment and just pray this very um, how would I say it? I want to say it's a dangerous prayer. I want to say it's a dangerous prayer because it could cause you to do something you don't want to do right now. But I would ask you during this last song just to pray and say, God, is there anybody in my life that you want me to be reconciled with? And if so, show me. Show me who that is. And if it's too big for you to do, it's definitely God telling you that. And I will say this, the reason, the reason I felt led to create that uh, or to ask someone to create that brochure about prayers, it's got three prayers in there. It's got a prayer for friends, family, and marriage. And the process that I laid out right here is on the front of it. I'm not saying that you go by that prayer word for word. You can but do you know what the disciples asked Jesus for? They watched him do all these miracles. They watched him heal people. They watched him make food appear. And here's what they said. Out of all that, they said, they watched him walk on water. They said, teach us how to pray. What I would ask you to do is take one of those today even if you don't need it today, even if, even if for some reason you don't, hear some, you don't hear a name, take one today and let God teach you how to pray and watch what he does. I mean, you don't, you don't even have to be fully on board sometimes for God to do something. So pray that prayer.